feeling that you don't get from static space. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if we went to, um, we had like some type of an art gallery near our school, but it wasn't open or stuff. We just sat outside of it and then we just talked from there. Um, I know a lot of classrooms have, a, a lot of schools have outdoor space. Um, where you can take your class for outdoor class. But I mean more than that, like having a field trip, but it's not a for me field trip, it's to just get out of the school zone. Mm -hmm. And that came up to us, like the school being that space that you kind of have expectations and routines for that are, um, that are just, just so controlled. Mm -hmm. Whereas you go somewhere just to go there, like go to the park. Um, go across the street and do a walk around the school or just around the neighborhood and sit in the corner. And I know it kind of limits the rules of the, of the school, but I feel like we need to push that boundary. We're pushing it with an online space. We're going on graph. We're going on um, Twitter. We're getting students to blog, but we're not really letting them leave the school property mm -hmm. as often as we like. Um, I mean, there's lots of parents or volunteers who can come in with you if that's the case of supervision. But I feel like they just need to use the world, the physical world, not the virtual, as a space of their own, rather than where we just get them in their tables and we can make these groups and make these pods. Um, but more and more kids want to go, can I work outside? Can I like, get out of this four square? So I feel like she had a really good idea when she took us to this place. It's just to be out, not not for the necessarily like, learning about. We're going to talk about go to, No, but. we went and did math yeah. <laughs> in, in an art gallery. Yeah. Like just go and do something. And I know it's really challenging. I think yeah, the freedoms school. are restricted, right? We have so many loopholes Rules. to jump yeah. through. To so I, I almost wonder if you could get you a blue. <laughs> Here, here's a concept. A blanket permission form in September, if you were that kind of an educator where you knew that that's what you were going to do, that you would say, okay, here's a map of where my school is. These are different places that over the school year I think my class may interact yes. with. They're all within walking distance. When I do a trip like this, I will have this ratio of adult to child supervision. I signed up for my kindergarten. Right? And, and so if this is, you know, if you're in agreement, this is, you know, once a month or a couple times a month, we are, or ad hoc. We are going to be doing this, but I'll always give you a heads up the day before that this is what we may be planning, or maybe it will be spontaneous. Yes. But well, I mean, I'm sure you what parameters we can get approved, I guess, yeah. is, is the issue. Class does that. Yeah, and that's great to hear, right? That some yeah. admin has approved that. Yeah, and it's, it's yeah. We got a permission form home about two months ago, maybe that said they want to go on walks around the neighborhood, and yeah. so the same yeah. you know the ratio. Like we don't even know what days they go. But mm -hmm. They just she'll come home and she'll say, "Hey, mommy, we walked around the neighborhood." Awesome. I feel like, like not just kids, but just human beings. When we get to interact with the environment, we learn. The learning is so much more um, free, and, and authentic <laughs> that it stays with you. Like those are the moments you talk about. I still remember my grape shoot trip to Rockwood, um, thirty-five years ago. <laughs> like, you know, it's it's. I, I think when you have all of those sensory um, experiences. It becomes part of you and it remains with you and you you really do learn and you learn so much more than that curricular aspect right all the soft skills come up to you mm -hmm. um, i totally agree i think uh the space you're in affect you so much you're always just coming into the same classroom like you know it's almost like how uh, your sensory levels kind of drop below mm -hmm. and like things like creativity and like inspiring places and what that goes on and being in different environments can affect you in a lot of different ways uh i'm curious anyone here read the third teacher I have in the classroom is a third teacher. Uh, yeah, yeah, they're third teacher. So uh, it's fascinating. Jim and both kind of diving into it recently, and uh, even just the title itself is really interesting. It's a focus on. It's from that's actually three design firms who wrote the book, and it's about seven or eight years old now. Um, even the title was really fascinating. You know, the mm -hmm. third teacher, um, and looking at how our physical spaces affect us as learners and environments in a variety of different ways. Um, and so it's just really interesting because it really just dives into everything we possibly think about a space and how does it affect us as learners and how does it pay to bridge it and Was anyone part of the theme-based classrooms? I, we had themes in the classrooms when I was in. Um, I went uh, to Toronto Board when I was in elementary school and then here for 
junior, but it was so fun because it was like a brand new thing. And I taught abroad, and it was mostly kindergarten and grade one, and we had things that we got to death. I'm going to challenge you on but, that. But I, I know that I'm not, I know that we were on the wrong path with things mm -hmm. because we were focusing on one aspect at a time, and I don't mean it as a unit. I mean it as like, Apples. what a nice way of including a theme into your class for celebrating or an event or something like that. But I, I know academically, I don't mean it academically, I mean it as the space to kind of be an engaging theme. Like this month we can focus on decorating our class in this mindset and then but not don't move on, but have it in our back and then just keep going. So like a recursive theme, mm -hmm. but not academic with the space. I'm not. But I think it's as also challenging what is in our space. That's and true. sometimes there's a fear of if I get rid of something, I might never get it back. Yeah. And you know, when I go into classrooms, you know, I look, is it cluttered? How do I feel in the classroom? Do, are things coming in? And question, why do we have to have this certain piece of furniture in the desk? What are the walls? And challenging your admin to say, okay, these doors aren't working, can we take them down? And when they say no, you keep going. And questioning why do we have to have certain things? I went into a school where I was told, everybody has to have a teacher's desk. Why? Mm -hmm. And eventually it came out that the custodian didn't want to move because we didn't have space. Well, we found space, and we moved them all, and it changed. But teachers were asking for about three or four years for that to happen. But until we actually found out the reason why, it's something that we could have you know, eliminated. But it's questioning which we want our spaces to look like, and asking our students, what do you want yeah. your space to look like? Kind of including one, them, that's important. Sorry, one of the best activities I did with the grade four classes, going back probably four years ago now, was um, I gave them blank paper and I just said, imagine your, what would your learning space look like if it could be anything you wanted and you could learn whatever you want. And we did this for ongoing for over a week. And it was because as we delved more and more into it, it was like, okay, so what are you going to learn? Well, I want to learn about skateboarding. Great. Who are you going to learn that from? Because I can't teach that. I'm not an expert. And then it was like, okay, well, then they investigated the experts in that field. Okay, how are you going to get a hold of them? How are you going to bring them into your learning space? Oh, well, I need technology, I need this, I need that. And it was really neat, all of the questioning and the inquiry that went into that and the spaces they designed, because the spaces they designed obviously had pleasure centers and, you know, they were, yeah, and, yeah. There were, and there was, you know, and vending machines <laughs> and video gaming and all this stuff. But what it shows is that learning, when you make it, that it's not just I sit here and I have to work with this tool and there's this, you know, thing that I'm learning from but that there are these other things that I jump in and out of and come back to and I refresh myself somewhere and then come back to the learning or uh, you know, how I'm engaging and who I'm engaging with. Um, I just, you know, I think it brings you to, a new, to what it could be. Well, there's this, like, this myth that you have to study or learn something like in the exact same way. Mm -hmm. um, there's a really fascinating book called The Surprising Truth About How We Learn. And I read it over the summer, have you read it? Mm -hmm. Oh, so good. But well, the part that stood out for me is that, like, one of the parts of the way was that, like, we tell kids, when you go home to do your homework, you have a dedicated space, you go there every day, at the same time you do your work and whatever. But in fact, the research shows that that's like the worst way to learn, and that's what we do here in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, because you're not just, like when you're learning, you're taking in your sensory, like unbeknownst to you, your sensory perceptions are taking it and adding to the layers of your learning. So they say you have to vary it. So like one day, you know, you sit in a certain spot, and that's great, and then the next, and listen to a certain music. The next day you sit in a different spot, or you're doing something else, and you know, like, um, you know, like for me, I love to work at um, my daughter's dance studios while they're dancing. Well, because it's a, such a creative atmosphere. There's, there's mm -hmm. laughter, there's background noise, there's music. Um, and like that really appeals to me. But then other days, I want to sit on the couch with my dog and with my laptop on my lap. And so like, but there, and so what we do in the classroom is like counterintuitive because we think that's what it is, that's the best way to learn, but it's really not. Research shows you have to be like varying your space constantly. And I think that's the key word, it's space versus place, that your learning space is always here. Mm -hmm. This is our learning space and we can take it anywhere we want. And depending on the learning that we're doing, 
there may be a certain places that are more conducive to the type of learning they want to do versus others. Like maybe when you're on your couch, you're really intensely thinking, whereas when you're at the dance studio, you're brainstorming, and it's more of, it's not, as, I, I don't know, I'm just guessing, right? Um, of, you know, for me, when I need to really think, it has to be quiet. I can't have external things going on because I get I'm a squirrel. <laughs> so that's but, but, but when I'm when I'm like, oh, this is brainstorm stuff. Yeah, then there can be lots of things going on because I'm actually grabbing from those things mm -hmm. as part of my creative process, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think philosophically, then we have brought ourselves up and our kids to be like, there's a place you learn. Okay. No, right? we don't. Like I sit on my bed when I'm. Mm -hmm. Or and I, but then I, here's a dilemma. I have a hard time choosing where to go because I have so many space choices. So that's really challenging for me because when I was learning, I was always one space, right? Mm -hmm. So now it's kind of like, where do I go? I want to, I want to read, but everything has to be clean before I do anything. Yeah, <laughs> I can't. So it's that's a procrastination. Thing. <laughs> 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 At least for me, so it is. <laughs> It, it's it's kind of like everybody has needs to clear, and I have this. This is where I go differentiate with my husband. He's always like, just go, just go do it. I'm like, no, no, no. I has like I have to be not thinking about these this clutter. It has to be out of my mind before I can start something new. So just everybody learns different, you know, like different ways you could clear up your space and get to the mindset. Just a couple things for me. Like one going back to what Andrew said, like um, when we're I mean we're already spending a lot of time in our classrooms, obviously, and so yeah. one piece of that. Uh, I would say 99% of the time our classrooms are designed by the teacher, but the classrooms will be more for the students. I think it's really important to try and let them have uh, some say and some ownership of what their classroom looks like and what that space is like. Um, and kind of like secondly, the space too, too uh, what's kind of coming out from this conversation is that we all learn differently, we'll have different spaces over different modes and different times. And that's something we as educators need to be really aware of, that our kids are going to be so, so different in what works for them, what space works for them, and how it works for them, and when it works for them. Um, and that's something we need to be very conscious of too, and kind of help them through that. And one understanding themselves too, because a lot of them don't think about that or reflect on that. Well, wouldn't um, it be neat if in September, I mean, we always come in in August and we set up our classroom, and you know, we, we think about where the spaces are gonna be. Well, what if we did that less, and we allowed the first two weeks of September to be, what is our community space going to be? What, what are the needs awesome. in this classroom that we're going to design it together? We're like, kind of in that space right now, right? so we put an application for TLP, and a big part of it was looking, we're collaborating our classes together, and mm -hmm. we're kind of waiting to hear back on some stuff here still too, but a big, we're doing a lot of different things actually, <laughs> but one big focus was the physical space of the classroom, what it looks like, and so uh, we're kind of waiting to hear back on some funding, but with the idea, like we didn't say, like, this is what we're exactly going to do, we're going to take that and come back to our students, get, like, have them do some research, and like, what's a good learning space, what works for you personally, and then let's have you design how this is going to go. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I was going to say, I did that um, with an IB class. I taught IB grade four overseas. And it, I mean, it's all inquiry based learning. And that was the first thing we did in the school year. And luckily, we had the funding mm -hmm. for resources. I know it's different in private, but um, so that was really, really, really effective. And it worked. And it was awesome. And it was kicking off the year with inquiry based learning with complete student participation and input. And they really guided a lot of the course of our year. We were really lucky to be able to step outside the classroom a lot because we pretty much had like free reign. We tell the parents in the morning, like, we're going to get into the marina today, and we're bringing it into you know this aspect of whatever we're studying at the time, and you know, quick little conversation in the morning, and we could do it. So that really worked. But I think what we're talking a lot about here is like physical space versus mental space, and with the limitations. I'm guessing you're all working in public, Catholic, mm -hmm. yeah. So with the physical limitations, like not everyone's getting funding to have an alternative classroom, not everyone can like get rid of their tables and chairs. Not everyone can afford to have like beautiful furnishings and all that and music and whatever else. So how do we, um, I think the question I have for the group is like, even without the ideal physical space, how do we create ideal learning spaces for inquiry-based learning? Even without being able to change the physical, how can we create? And I think you've answered a little bit of that already, but like how can we do it without so we're not putting limitations on ourselves saying, well, I don't have funding, so I can't do that. So, so just I want to jump in really quick. So one thing is, let's say nothing in the class could physically change. Yeah. What's I thing? used to let my kids work under my desk or under their desk. Mm -hmm. I would be like, as long as you are focused and learning, I don't care where you work. Yeah. Yeah. 
so your first, I just tell them, your learning, or sorry, your, the choice of where you're going to learn is yours until it no longer works, then it becomes mine. <laughs> so if, I mean, now he's teaching grade four. Mm -hmm. So if they were really, you know, if it was they were being silly and kicking each other under, okay, that's not a good learn. Are you learning? Mm -hmm. Either try to learn there, if not, move, right? And, and, right? and then if they couldn't, I would structure it. But I think that can be one where you don't have to necessarily get rid of things or um, add things to your classroom. It's about giving them the freedom to choose where they're working. Mm -hmm. Nobody had a desk. I turned all the desks in so they didn't have a place to put their things and they could always move, mm -hmm. right? So, but the funding thing, I think what would be neat too with a class, if you didn't have funding, is to say, okay, we don't have money for this, so how could we go about doing this? What are other ways? Could we fundraise? Could we go to we um, that garage sales? sales? My principal shot that down. Oh, really? Yeah. And so you got to play with the system, too, because you get different answers from different people, and I think some caution, too. But, like, Jamie was looking at this last semester, she reached out to me, and my suggestion was, do some crowdfunding, like get your kids to start a campaign, start up a crowdfunding website, say, we want to redesign our classroom, mm -hmm. and like, just publicize, like yeah. get an authentic experience, and say, hey, anyone can donate. It could be three bucks, it could be 10 bucks, it could be 20 bucks. Parents can throw it in, get your friends, and the kids can chip in themselves, and hey, we've got a pile of money now, let's go spend it to redesign our classroom. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, we look at the there is, like when you're bringing things in the classroom, like you can buy a couch, the couch falls over, the kid falls off the couch and hits their head. I mean, those are the questions we go through, which are they're kind of ridiculous, but I now also understand where they're coming from, and everyone's like looking for the next lawsuit. And trying to avoid because I think lawsuit. classrooms that we grew up in were more, the teachers could bring in their own things and their own, and now we're getting to this point where you're not allowed to even bring in your own books. Like, uh, that's the school I was at. You were not allowed to bring in your own library. Like, you had to come from the school yeah. library because if you lost your books, we can't replace them. Like, it was things like that. Like, it was just yeah. getting so ridiculous, right? Um, well, bed bugs are in books, too. Oh, gosh. Too, so that's probably the spot. That's what I've heard about. Yeah, bed bugs, they're actually overrunning the library. Yeah. And they're hard yeah. to get rid of, so. Yes, yeah. yeah, so you're not allowed cloth and. <laughs> Alexis, I'm going to push back a little bit. And I totally appreciate your question. This is a really good discussion. I think so much in the educational system right now, we just kind of accept things for how they are. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at it, walk into a classroom, you look at all the chairs and the desks, and here, like a fair bit of money went into buying these desks and chairs. And you can pretty much walk in any classroom or across your school board, and they're all the exact same. If you were to take from the school board standpoint, say, here's a pile of money for a classroom. This is what was spent in here, and then open that up into what that would look like or what that should look like. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can possibly not just one person sold, but if you had enough voices saying, you know, we want this to be different, there's a pile of money that's being spent all the time. And if a large number of people start saying, maybe this isn't the right way, and start pushing back up the bottom, you might start seeing some people reflecting at the top and start seeing that change to come down eventually. Mm -hmm. and I think, I, for me personally, I think we just so often we say, well, this is how it is, so how do we work around the system? Mm -hmm. When, well, we do need to work around I the system, like, we yeah. need to push back on the system at the same time, too. Okay, you can do two things in parallel. Yep. Work with what you have. I totally better. Uh, but in the meantime, like, while you're waiting uh, for funding, uh, uh, also, uh, uh, you know, uh, the other thing that I just made though with that is that from a facility standpoint, yep. it's really easy to manage. If I, you know, a new classroom, they get 30 desks, 30 chairs, mm -hmm. this is what I buy, yep. it's this order number, and it costs this much, right? Mm -hmm. If I have to now say, okay, every classroom gets $2,000 or $2,500 and this is yours to spend and then I've got a everybody's lists are different and everybody's sizing is different and all that stuff it goes back <laughs> the link I made is to pedagogy you know how people there's some people who they just like this is my lesson plan and this is what I do every September and then you know next September will be the same versus the okay here's the big idea that we're going to um, investigate and it's it's more messy and it's less yeah. there's a whole lot less people doing that kind of teaching than there is doing the here's the clean and the easy Right? And so, so we're up against that all the time. Yeah, I remember like, I mean, like even again, you have what we have going back and changing after the fact. But as we're looking at building new schools, we're a growing region. Uh, my wife and I just moved. And we're thinking, kids, the next couple of years, just down the street from where I moved in, there's a new school going in in two or three years from now. So this is really kind of in my headspace to start thinking about that. Like, as our board goes to look and build new schools, are we just going to keep doing what we've always been doing? Which mm -hmm. I would say the last four or five schools we built have kind of been that space, or are we reflecting like, is this the best way to go? Uh, <coughs> funding from the Ministry was like $34 million was the request for that school. How's that money going to be spent? Because if they have that pile now, what's that going to look like as they go ahead? Well, is it going to be the same as what we've always I'm done? I'm sorry I keep jumping in. No, please, please feel free to shut my mouth. Um, but the other piece to that is who's making those decisions? Yep. And it's not educators, right? It's not people in the classroom that work with students that are making the decisions about the design space, 
Mm -hmm. I think too, like when I when I look back to my childhood as well, we had a, an amazing courtyard. So not like Coronation mm -hmm. has a tiny little courtyard you can like look across it and it's like seven feet across. This was massive and it had a rolling hill in the middle and big trees and you could walk out and you could have maybe two or three classrooms out there, right? Interacting with nature and not interfering with each other. True. And you see even Ryerson has this massive property, yeah. right? And they have an amazing kindergarten area that they spend all this money on and they have learning rocks exactly behind portables. So it's not like you're sitting in an outdoor classroom but you still have a portable as close as the window to you, mm -hmm. right? So you don't feel like you're part of it. But why can't they have, you know, an amazing sheltered area way down where we could go and we could sit even if it was cruddy weather, right? Yeah. And learn. But I don't know where, why that doesn't happen as part of the, you know, we, we fundraise for different things. But, but we're, I know at Coronation they had their big kindergarten set up, right? Where they wanted to have the natural, so it was like bear totems and neat kind of wood things. But I don't know where it came, like, it wasn't an educator that thought of those things, because a lot of the kids are kind of like, like, <laughs> and it's <laughs> also educating parents, like right now, yeah. my school wants to do an outdoor classroom, yeah. and for three years, I've kind of stopped them, because they want the typical stage on the stage, the rocks in the youth circle, mm -hmm. you know, a blackboard at the front, and they keep challenging on them, but that is their mindset, yeah. and then um, a couple years ago, when we were doing the kindergarten renovations, some principals had a lot of saying how the classroom was um, decorated and designed. And so you go in, and some classrooms have bright colors, lime green countertops. And when you go in, you're like, it looks dated. I can't believe they did this. Who designed it? And then the kindergarten teams were also allowed to buy their own equipment. But some of them didn't have experience on how to use different equipment. So in one school, they brought light tables. They didn't buy the manipulatives. They bought bigger pieces that allowed for more play, while well, other schools spent a lot on the little things because they wanted more. But that wasn't necessarily the best practice because they just thought, oh, I have $4,000. Let's spend as much as I can instead of taking that time to reflect. Mm -hmm. But it's also inviting people into your classroom. Invite your administrator. You know, I invite facilities all the time. Like when they told me I couldn't take these doors down, I invited them in when kids were in class during those high transition areas, so they actually saw what it was like to be in the classroom. And the uh, supervisor's like, I didn't realize how chaotic it was with 30 little bodies moving around. And the next day, doors are gone. But it was actually having people to come in. But talking to other teachers, they're nervous to have people come in. Mm -hmm. So we have to change their mindset about, you know, be open, talk about it, invite others in. But that's hard sometimes. Yeah, it goes back to that whole piece of vulnerability. People don't want to show their vulnerability, right? And they, they don't want to, and, and I mean, it goes to the whole thing about sharing. People don't share their teaching practices or what they're doing. You're laughing, right? No, because I just wrote a blog about it. Post. I haven't shared it on my blog, oh. but I, I wrote a post and you just read it, so I'm laughing. And it's all related to yeah. vulnerability. Because, like, we're team teaching, so like, he's in my room and I'm in his room. And mm -hmm. do that, especially in secondary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's been like a big thing for me is to be like completely vulnerable that he sees what I'm doing and that our kids see what we're doing and then they know that we're learning too. So mm -hmm. it's been like it's the vulnerability piece. Yeah. I'm just yeah. laughing because you're like using the same language. <laughs> you well, it, you know, my Twitter thing it, it, it says like show your vulnerability and the power you're learning because if you can show that this is my authenticity, I'm not perfect and I just want to learn, then somebody goes, I can help you. I, hey, have you thought about doing this, right? And if you don't, if you always have walls up that I'm the expert and I know this and whatnot, then, or just not even that approach, but just don't, I know I'm not gonna share because I'm too scared. No one would find it valuable, right? That's the other piece. So you get the, I'm either bragging or nobody would really, it's not important, right? Nobody would, this isn't gonna resonate. How do we inspire students to be lifelong learners if we're not willing to demonstrate mm -hmm. ourselves? Mm -hmm. It's like the major issue in every, I've worked in 24 schools, or I've been to 24 schools throughout programs, and the schools that have open doors that have collaborative teaching, like authentic collaborative teaching, that are really demonstrating that their teachers are constantly learning, that share their teachers' PD, that the results of the PD are up and on boards, and like they're really showing that these teachers don't know everything. Mm -hmm. They seem to be like the best school cultures to work in. So what's missing? Like how do we bring that into, the public or Catholic system in Ontario. 
So it's been really interesting learning for us. Um, it's kind of evolving over time, but a uh, big focus for us has been modeling for our students, like just being really wide open. Uh, we're focusing on collaboration with our kids, and we're going to ask our classes to collaborate digitally and face-to-face -face a fair bit. Uh, and so that started off with us modeling that, um, and kind of being, doing that very openly in front of them, showing that you can be in that space with them, uh, and the good and the bad. Um, and the other really just kind of coming back to what we're talking about here, like, it's as teachers we're on islands so much. Like you have your classroom and like Barry and Bob comes in, you're kind of there on your own. And yeah. one of the best in the space was Jamie uh, messaged me in the first semester and talking to a student, like I've got the situation and they'll really what do you think about this? I'm like, well I've got some ideas but I don't know they can at all. And that's another space where us as teachers we really you don't have anyone to go talk to about your classroom because no one else is in there with you or no one else knows that student in the moment what's going on. So we started thinking about doing this team teaching that was part of it too, is like having some of this bounce ideas off and have a sounding board to work through and watching each other too. Like I've learned so much just from being in a classroom three times already and I'm changing my practice in, in the same way too, right? Um, it's been it's very simple, but it's been very transformed a lot of ways. So many times, and you go to conferences, they're fantastic. In a place like this, and you sit down in a room and talk to someone, and they get great ideas. But it's so much different being just in a teacher's classroom, seeing how they work and how they respond to questions, how they ask questions, what they do with their students. It's been just by sitting in someone's classroom for half an hour has been better PD for me than going to conferences where I see phenomenal speakers talk. Um, but I've taken so much more practical delivery from it. Is that something that the rest of you would want in your schools, like the space for collaborative learning from each other? I mean, that's a well, space. Like we're in different too, right? schools. Like, we're well, you're in different schools. Yeah, yeah we drive even better. Yeah, totally. But like, what totally. about within your school? I like the thought I just had, because you're an administrator, sorry to let everybody know that you did, but is that whole piece about what if you offer to staff? I mean, I'm for okay. Let's say you put it out there and you said, I know that your planning time is yours, but what if you took one planning time a week and you went to another a teacher's yeah. classroom and watched them and you guys pair up and then they come watch you and then take another one three weeks from now and talk about, or uh, closer than that, I guess, mm -hmm. and, and talk about what you saw in each other's classroom. Ask, you know what, it's not judgment, it's, I noticed you did that. Where did that come from? How did, what does it do for you? Uh, like, how does it help your students? And, okay, if I were to do that in my classroom, what might that look like, or where would I start, right? And building that trust with each other, because that's what a lot of it is, is that I don't trust, first of all, that you're not going to judge me, mm -hmm. and then I don't, you know, or, or and that it's that insecurity piece, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we did color houses last year, and I paired up teachers specifically. So one week the teachers were released, the other, that same week the teachers were working with a group of students, but I made people go into different teachers' classrooms. And my grade six teacher had never been in the kindergarten classroom for two years. It was a brand new build. She's like, "This is beautiful." And just by teaching for forty-five minutes in that space with the students, she looked at the environment and then had those questions. Okay, why would you set it up this way? Why would you have this? Why don't you have more books in your class? So then they started having that conversation when she was looking at her space. So this year we didn't have color houses, and I was holding off until my staff said, we need it, but I want to switch up our partners so we can see other spaces. Awesome. But it was kind of, you know, I had to push it a little bit and kind of drop little hints, but they got it, but they loved being in each other's rooms. But wouldn't it cool. be neat now if not just that I get to bring my students into the space, but because there's a little bit of trust now with that conversation occurring, now you say, okay, Heidi, someone's going to teach your grade sixes so that you can go and watch Andrea teach kindergarten mm -hmm. what reading looks like in kindergarten or what the you know this half hour looks like there mm -hmm. and vice versa let the kindergarten teacher come to my space and pr participate in learning in that space and then have that conversation about the pedagogy what's happening mm -hmm. and uh, so you you know you're building up your you know, I actually did go to a kindergarten, I made a request, so I went for half a day to kindergarten, and I teach grade 7, and I thought there's got to be something there with their inquiry that I can translate to the uh, age group that I teach, and um, it was um, opportunities, so the environment was, there were opportunities for the kids to explore all over the classroom, and I thought, I could do that with grade 7s, and they would love it. Um, on that theme, I wanted to also bring up a conversation that was at Google um, with Carlo talking about an opportunity by putting, he wants to uh, paint um, like a, a green screen right mm -hmm. on the wall. So um, then opportunity for, for that creation when, when uh, students are inspired to do something like that, like that and take themselves to a different location altogether because they could define the space however they want. Mm -hmm. 
in, and like you said, it's up here, but then they can virtually make it. So I just thought that was kind of a neat idea, is the whole idea of if you can't change the furniture or the way it's the layout, it's the opportunities that in the environment. That, um, well, one of the things I, I think what you're speaking of too is the idea that um, I think we need to think differently about how we structure our lessons because to me learning is an experience and so that's what I'm really trying to like, we talk about all the time about like what kind of an experience are we providing for our kids so that they can draw out what they need to draw out or what they find fascinating and so I think like for, traditionally it's thought of as this is the lesson this is what the learning goal this is the kid what kids are going to take from it but like we really try to design experiences that we think will engage and then kids will be able to close. So it's a, to me it's a mind shift that like we haven't <laughs> gotten far enough. And I think that's what you're talking about, is it's experience. Mm -hmm. Experience, you're right. And at secondary, like that's like a really crazy idea. But <laughs> <laughs> it starts already in elementary. I and young elementary. Um, oh. where, you know, everybody has to do the same thing at the same time. That's well, not an experience. Right? Well, right? that's experience. A, that's a, well that is an experience, but not necessarily an experience you want them to be having, mm -hmm. right? But it is the experience that's easy to manage. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of times the way we as educators come towards something. It's easy to manage. So we're all gonna do this, right? Um, from a management standpoint versus from a learning experience standpoint. But I would say sometimes when you have that freedom, like you were saying, choice of where to work is yours, that from a management standpoint is way easier if you embrace it. Absolutely. Because then you've got students, and I've seen that they're not in the grade one, grade two, they can manage that because then they're in control of themselves, right? They can think, okay, well, the teacher's going to have a read aloud. We don't all have to squish. 30 of our bodies onto this little carpet, mm -hmm. and people are in my space, and one person's bum crack is staring at me. And <laughs> yeah. are, you know, yeah, and where they can they can just say, we're going to have a read aloud. Find where you are going to be the most comfortable, and it's amazing. Like you'll have a kid laying across the top of a desk, and another one under a desk, and some children pacing back and forth, and they're all attending, and they're all receiving the message, and it's amazing. Right, right. it goes back to student choice. Yeah, they because if you're choice. saying sit, 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 sit the whole time, and they can't. It's just they don't care. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. That's been my, one of my big shifts in the past five years in my teaching practice. And I think one of the, the biggest roadblocks for teachers with making that change is uh, you mentioned the idea of like being in control. I think for teachers, it's the illusion of control. Like, mm -hmm. We want to feel like we have control over our classroom. I know all my kids are doing what they're doing, and that this is my classroom management strategy, and this is what works, and I've got this nice box. Um, and we need to move them out of that space, and that was like a big shift for me. Um, I really focus on the illusion of control because you're never really in control of your classroom, no matter what you think. Um, but as much as we feel like we are, like if, we, if I just do this and try to keep them all in the same spot, I'll be in control. And it, it does sound. I would have. I've been in that box, right? And when you're like in that box, and you're looking outside of that box. Like, no, that sounds like zaniness. That's just gonna be complete chaos. Um, but it does work. It works really, really well to give your kids more freedom. And then you get to more of that personalized approach for your students and move their own pace. And, and it, that also sounds scary for like, how do I manage that? How do I assess that? How do I know where my kids are? How do I get them going where I want them to be? Um, but you can work and it is, it's much more manageable than you would think it is. And as it sounds, I think it that is. goes back to what you said, having that um, open um, sheet for the students. How do you learn would be a great way to kind of um, build your assessment tools and how you're going to assess that one particular child who's pacing but mm -hmm. listening so you can kind of observe how their their learning style is affecting their um, their um, strategy is affecting their learning and are they progressing do they need um, another space or another place to work you just made me think of my son I, have, I actually took a video of him doing this he was doing math homework and so for me I have to have it be quiet He's listening and singing while doing it and getting the correct and, answers. And it was working. And I'm just like, I couldn't do that. But he's also a drummer. He can do different things with his body at the same time. <laughs> I can't, right? But and then but we have to be okay with that. Yes, that's, that's the, the part we have to do okay. is that is that <laughs> we have to go. Oh, he is learning, or that student is producing, and they are contributing, right? They're not off task because they're, they're moving and they're being yes. and they're you know professing noise or expressing something. Um, he got in trouble for doodling during a presentation. Oh, wow. um, he's in grade eight. And, <laughs> and oh, I doodle all the time, right? Because he wasn't um, being respectful, giving the respectful, respectful attention. And to me, that mom, it was like, it was boring. Like, it just, you know, and I'm like, you're not going to be engaged 100% of the time, right? But at least he was quiet. 
He was doing something, you know, creative. Need to show you. It's from the third teacher. Make peace with fidgeting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Think of it as brain development, which I it is. Mm -hmm. Then yeah, think of how to make room for it in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would love to, but sh they would be okay. <laughs> 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 it already has five just, ends. Hey, the research so much. Yes. <laughs> okay. Can I get the research? I yeah. Know. The research, that works for adults, too. So I work with uh, <laughs> startups and small businesses. And when I do training programs, I put little boxes on every table, and we get them things to fidget with. Like adults sit there and will like fidget with Legos or like the squishy balls that you can buy from the dollar store, or, like fuzzy balls or pens or markers or whatever, and they're like drawings that you have in big books and like that. I mean, it's proven to work. Like it's I don't know. But how do we create a school culture where teachers are able to teach in the way that's most effective for them and for their learners, and where students are able to learn in the way that's most effective for them? Because I think a lot of what it comes down to is, especially for new teachers, I know when I started teaching, like I have a head of school, because I was overseas, we had like, the head of the school would walk by the door, and if my students were sitting on the desk or sitting on the floor, and you know, they were reading, and they were comfortable, and they were happy, and they were, you know, engaged, but they weren't looking the way that, according to the head of school, mm -hmm. should look, and it wasn't embraced by other teachers, because they'd come by and be like, oh, her classroom is out of control, and you can't be <laughs> talking about yeah, it. But yeah. how, <laughs> so how do you create, I mean, does it have to come from the head of school or the principal, or how do you create an, a culture in your school where that's embraced, like, where that's really I, I don't think it's just school, though. I think it's a societal mm -hmm. culture shift. Because I think yeah. if, like, if people walk by my room, they must think it's chaos going on. Mm -hmm. Because there's like, kids in the hall, there's kids down the hall, there's kids like all over. It's like, it's crazy. And I'm like the quietest teacher in the building. And like, my <laughs> class is the loudest. Um, so you don't have any class management. Right, exactly. yeah. yeah. That's what okay. I said. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But, um, but I, I also think that's, like, there's got to be a parental, uh, okay, because, like, one of the things right now is start a son, too, for us. And kids are like, are, we, are you sure we're meeting curriculum? And I'm like, yes, we are meeting curriculum. <laughs> because the expectation is you come in, you sit down, you open your book, you write your note, you read, you answer the questions. Mm -hmm. And that's not at all <laughs> what we do. And so, the, but I've had like kids where I'm, I have said to me, you can't use technology because you can't learn with technology. Right. But that's coming from there. <laughs> yeah. That's a parent, yeah. right? Like I can totally. Yeah, that's a kid who's had a conversation with their parents who, and you know they're having at home. They're like, you got to put your phone away. You got to do whatever because you can't learn that way. And so then it's like. So I don't have just have to change her mind, or I have to like convince her that what we're doing is a legitimate curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's that I'm going to have to. I'm sure I'm going to meet the family at parents' night in a couple of weeks, and I'm going to have to like sell it to them too. So I don't think it's just classroom. That's or what I was going to say. You have to be prepared to sell it, and you have yeah. to stand on your own and say, "This is what I believe in, and I believe it's successful." Mm -hmm. And you have to teach the children to self-advocate. Right? Mm -hmm. They need to be. In, they need to know what works for them, and they need to convince other people. I find it's hard when you have those free-flowing classrooms and then you have a, a music teacher that comes in or you have your coverage and, and they have a complete different, different expectation of what's appropriate as far as response and structure and and it's really hard for those kids. And don't you find that they experience more behavior than you do from your kids? Oh, huge. Right? And then they complain yeah. to you that you have a class that's out of control and I'm like, but when they're with me, they're not. Yeah. And it's not because I'm, I'm faking it and saying they're not a problem for me, but they're not. And I think it's right. just because the, the, the style is so completely different mm -hmm. that the kids do, they get a little bit more defiant and they just want it the way that they know works for them but they can't communicate to mm -hmm. that teacher that, you know, to... So why can't you communicate? I think, I think you try. Way. You try and, <laughs> and one thing I'd use in past too is that, you know what, when I'm in this room with you, the, this is what it's like and when there is another teacher, understand that their expectations are what you need to respect. Mm -hmm. And that different people will have different expectations, and that's not a bad soft no, skill yeah, to learn either, yeah. because we all have to work with different people. I do that. I mean, I got to work with Mark over there some days, and it's hard. So, <laughs> you know, and, and so I, it's not necessarily a bad. There are times on my like supply plans, like so. Last semester, first period, I had grade ten applied kids. They'd walk in late consistently. I would leave them on my supply plans. If they made it to class. I pick my bag. Mm -hmm. And so just so that they wouldn't like go after those yeah. kids because the fact that a lot of those kids came to class was a win. Mm -hmm. and so I mean like I I I take my battles but I write on on our And I was talking about a culture of compliance versus a culture of learning. Mm -hmm. And I went into a school where on the first day of school the principal was supposed to read on an overhead 
the 110 rules oh my gosh. to the whole school. And it was rules like, do not throw your Kleenex on the ground. Do not, do not, do not. <laughs> and I thought, well, no. I'm going to bore everybody, but that was tradition. And the first you know, hour and a half of the school was the principal just going over the rules. Kindergarten to grade six. And so I threw it out, and people were like, well, what if there's Kleenex on the ground? Well, we teach that. <laughs> and so you can only only the rules. The pushback that I received from some staff members, the school is going to fall apart. And <laughs> then at the end, they realized we didn't really need those rules because we just had to keep adding to them. Because if somebody broke another rule, like don't break your pencil on purpose, was one of the rules. <laughs> oh <my gosh. laughs> but it was like full time. It's like I'm in charge. And so I'd be like, hmm, you broke a pencil on purpose, you're in the office. When we need to take that down, some people were fearful that the school is going to fall apart. But then what happens is everybody steps up. And it's the coaching. Okay, the next time you throw in the garbage, you know, make sure you, you put it in the garbage can. So you're not isolating and focusing. But sometimes when you're, I mean, the other piece that I had to do when I talked to the staff about it was I also had to talk to the parents before they were allowed to complain. Mm -hmm. So I always throw things out before the children can come home and talk about it. One small little thing I did in the school was all the kids used to eat in the gym and then for lunch. Kids went home sick, there were food fights, it was awful. So this was my mistake. I just waited to the newsletter to put it out. Well, parents had a week and a half to all complain, the calls were coming in. So next time I made a change that I knew was a little controversial, I sent out the information, then I made the change. So parents had a few days to process. But I learned I have to be so transparent, especially in this one community I'm working in, that if I do not share everything with them, there's a sense of panic sense of, you know, things are going to fall apart. But I say, share my rationale, and when it happens, nothing falls apart. I'm like, oh, okay, it worked again. But it <laughs> has to be that flip. That piece, though, that you just said about that, I share my rationale, and then, you know, they're calmer about it with, with your point Good of morning, Ed Campers. We are getting ready to wrap up session number one in the next couple of minutes, and getting ready to move on to session number two. In our computer lab, there is our introduction to teach computer science, our coding with Sergey. In the library, there is a session discussing coding. In room one, we'll be discussing Google Apps and classroom possibilities. In room three, we'll be talking about documenting, tracking, and analyzing student assessment. And in room four, we'll be talking about mindfulness. We'll tweet that photo out so you can check it out in case you missed that announcement. Moving on to session two in the next few minutes. Enjoy your conversations. And uh, somebody else mentioned it too, but the parent piece about, you know, at the beginning of the year, your parents come in and you have to sell what you're doing, is to actually make it really explicit. So when you have a bunch of parents in there to say, this room is going to look very different. This is how I'm meeting the curriculum through this medium, right? That they go, oh, okay, right? And then you have them on more supporting you versus fighting you. Wouldn't so it be terrible. easier if the entire school embraced that culture? But they of, won't. <laughs> but how, not, not, like, not like this, right? But not to that extent, but they embrace the culture of every classroom is different. Every teacher has their philosophy. We accept teachers learning this is how we learn as teachers. This is how we progress as a school. So how do you, like I really think, because you're saying, well, let's put it to the community. The community has to change, society has to change. But we have power over our classroom, and we have power over our school. Like, culture and community, I'm too poor on culture. Mm -hmm. But I really think, like, wouldn't it be easier if the entire school embraced it, and if the school together could put to the parents, like, this is how we do it in our school. These are our values, this is how we learn, this is how we progress as teachers, this is what you can expect from the teachers, because then the teachers just have to explain, well, this is how I do it in my classroom, but as you know, as a school, these are our values, this is how we do it. You're walking into an existing in a culture and yeah. institution where I would say 70% of the teachers there don't want to change. Mm -hmm. They like the way that it is, right? See? And then you've got 20 or 30% yeah. that really embrace and want to be like right out there and yeah. you know and, and do it. So I don't think you're ever going to get all. Unless and so, you know, unless you have a leader <laughs> yeah. who's embracing that and saying, come on guys, come on, we can all do this. And then you have that mass of 70 slowly moving mm -hmm. and that, you know, you're 20 or 30 who are taking them, pulling them, come on, let's go, come see. Um, I don't know, I don't think you can, you, you're gonna get the... I still think you can, like, you're supporting the fact that they're doing things their traditional way that they've done them for 30 years, but you're also supporting the fact that they're open to you doing whatever you're doing in your classroom. So as a community, like the overarching culture is to support different teachers and different learners with different teaching and different learning styles. 
I'm going to push back on it. I, I totally agree that you can do it. I, I have the good fortune to be a phenomenal school as a, as a culture of staff. Lots of people are doing great things. Um, I think one thing we're looking to make a culture shift is very, very difficult because we establish way of doing things. Um, and so much when you have a message coming from it, you have a bottom up push, you have to have a top down push. You need to be in the middle. Like everyone talks about bottom up or top down. No, you have to have both be in the middle to see the culture change. Um, but I think the biggest problem is people generally avoid the good why. They say, this is what you should be doing, and they stop there. And most people don't take all to that. It's like, okay, well, I'm doing, I think that I'm doing works, and you're telling me I should be doing something else. But you just tell me what else I should be doing. Um, I you know, like to have spaces and like, enjoy being in that space. The thing that I found that's worked best for me the past few years is like, there's two things. Like, one, you need to tell them, can I ask you about why? And then for teachers, you really want to move them to say, this is going to be best for your students, and this is going to be time neutral or time saver for you. They buy it. And most teachers, no matter where they are in their headspace, that's going to move them. Because most of us, like, let's say 98% of us in the profession, we're here for the kids. We care about the kids. And you say, this is probably better for your students. That's going to perk them up. And then, but they've also had the experience, like, we're very, very busy, and we don't want to get busier, and it's very difficult to be teaching doing a good job. Um, but there's a lot of shifts that we're talking about that I found it's either, it's either time neutral at worst, or more often than not, it saves me time. You can convince a teacher of those two or things. Or you stress because you're, you're going to have behavior. 100%. Yeah, right? Or explaining yourself every day, right? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.